Hello, everybody. Uh, so this is going to be the story I will talk about today. And as a small teaser, uh, I will start with the, the meme that my co-author created. So all we wanted to do is make a patch for these uh, small Spectre gadgets in the kernel. Uh, and in the end, we ended up with the LWN article uh, that made the kernel um, upgrade from the C standard C89 to C11. So this is roughly what I'm going to be, be speaking about today. So we'll start with some uh, Spectre background, uh, followed by an interesting case study that we found uh, with our tool, uh, and how this was revealing even more uh, real bugs in the list iterator. Uh, so first, some very simple background on speculative execution. Uh, so we have an array here with 128 bytes. So it's a string, and then we have some very stupid code to uh, calculate how long the string is. Uh, so we execute that uh, iteration. So we start with i equal is zero, and we access message uh, with the index zero. Uh, and on the right side, we're gonna see the cache layout. So blue means uncached, and as soon as something turns yellow, it will be cached. So now we access the first uh, byte of message. Uh, so the first 64 byte of message will be loaded into the cache, uh, assuming that you have 64 byte cache lines. And then we know that it's not zero, so we can count up. So now we do the same. So now for I1, that information will be already in the cache. So we can already start computing and count up. We do the same for I2, I3, I4, I5, and so forth until I63, which was still in the cache. And then we reach I64, uh, and that information is not yet in the cache. So the CPU needs to, be, needs to wait until that information is retrieved from memory, uh, which is slow. So the CPU wants to already compute ahead. So it doesn't know what the outcome of that branch is. So it's starting to predict what the outcome could be. And the first 64 cases, it was always true. So now the CPU will think probably it will be true one more time. So very basic. Uh, and as soon as that information becomes uh, available in the cache, it can commit that into the pipeline. So now what if the CPU is wrong? Uh, can we fool the branch predictor into thinking that something is true even though it's not? So we look at the very similar code example here. Uh, so now we have an array that is 129 bytes. So the last byte is in the, in the next cache line. And if we now look at the case where we already computed the first 128 uh, iterations, uh, and now we reach the last byte of the loop uh, and it is not cached, so we have to predict again something. So the CPU will think, all right, uh, we just do count one more time because we did that 128 cases already. But as soon as that information becomes available in the cache, uh, the CPU will figure out that the 129th byte is actually the null terminator and it should break instead. So it will roll back and commit the break case instead. And that by itself is just a performance optimization. Uh, but we can see that there are certain gadgets that can make uh, this a problem. So the very canonical Spectre V1 gadget uh, basically shows that you can leak information through this uh, using a side channel. So, and how it works is uh, you basically have something like get user, you load something from user space in the kernel. So the, the, the user space has, or the attacker has full control over that, what you're loading. And then you store that into X and check that whatever is loaded from user space is smaller than size. So you do a bounce check to make sure that it's not anything crazy. Uh, and then on the right side here, we see some kernel memory. So we see the array one, which has five bytes. So that's what you're allowed to access. And around it, you have kernel memory, like either on the heap or in the stack that you should not be accessing. So now we have that bounce check. Everything is great in normal execution. And you can only access something within that array. And now what? If we look at speculative execution, uh, we trick that branch into thinking that X is smaller than size, even though it's not. So we can access 
in speculative execution, we can access the content of that block, uh, even though it should not be executed. So we give it uh, some value of X that is larger than the size of the array. And we have uh, some secret byte that is located after the array and we load that. So that in, in itself is not necessarily a problem because everything will be rolled back and will not be committed into execution anyways. Um, so we load that secret into Y, uh, but now we have a secret dependent access in array two. Uh, and that means you can basically encode that information in a cache line. And through that you can uh, use the cache information to use a side channel to extract that information in user space. So obviously we don't want that to happen in the kernel. Uh, so what do we do? Or, or, or what defenses are already deployed in the kernel? So first uh, we have an LFence operation on the copy from user. Uh, so whenever you copy something from user space, uh, you have a check which does access okay. So if that access uh, is not okay, you should return zero. But then again, this is just a branch. And if you're unlucky, it will be mispredicted and it could execute some instructions with an invalid access. So you add an L fence that basically makes sure that there's no speculation beyond at this point. But the more interesting and more pervasively used uh, operation throughout the kernel uh, is the it's called array index no spec, uh, which basically makes sure that an index is safe, even in speculative execution. So here we see the do system call x64. Uh, it's used on 64-bit uh, Intel or ARM, uh, AMD on every system call. And you supply it the system call number, and it should be smaller than the number of system calls. And then you do an indirect call in the system call table, so if you uh, mispredict this branch, you could supply it a, a larger number, which would make you execute some other memory that you should not be executing. So to make sure that even speculatively this is safe, you use this macro, uh, array index no spec, to make sure that UNR will even speculatively be never larger than number of system calls. But what does the documentation about this actually say? So the documentation for Spectre says, for Spectre variant one, uh, vulnerable kernel code as determined by code audit and scanning tools is annotated on a case by case basis uh, to use the no spec accessor macros for bounds clipping to avoid any usable disclosure gadget. So what this in the end means is you don't avoid speculative execution, but you don't want any uh, disclosure of secret information through it. So you use those uh, gadgets or you use the array index no spec in cases that you found with manual or static analysis. And then it says, however, it may not cover all attack vectors for Spectre variant one. So when we were reading this, uh, we thought we can do better. Uh, so Brian Johannes Meyer, my co-author and I, uh, started a, a dynamic analysis approach uh, to find these gadgets in 2019. So for our solution, we're using something called uh, dynamic taint analysis, uh, but what is it? Uh, it's, um, I will start with a very simple example in user space. Um, so imagine you have a function uh, main with some arguments that you supply to the program, and then you uh, copy argv1 uh, into another variable with string copy, and somewhere later in the program, so this could be uh, in a completely other function, another file or whatsoever. So it doesn't need to be like strictly here. This is just to illustrate a very simple example. Uh, you use that variable in an exec VE. So obviously we don't want that to happen. You don't want the user to control what programs you uh, execute under your domain. So how could we detect something like this using dynamic taint analysis? Uh, and we're doing that, in this case, I show it with the DFSAN, which stands for Data Flow Analyzer, uh, sanitizer in uh, the LLVM project. So it's a LLVM pass, uh, where you can basically apply taint to a certain memory location. So for example, here, we apply the user taint to the memory location of argv1, uh, and say that is user controllable, 
uh, and then we use the framework to uh, propagate the taint. Uh, so we propagate taint based on the memory that we tainted. So it will basically like trickle down through the program to everywhere where that memory location or that memory values are copied to. So we see here that the taint flows to RV1 here and through the string copy, it will be also tainting proc. And now we have a tainted, a user controllable tainted uh, proc argument to exec VE here. So what we need to do now is basically we do a taint sync and define when do we want to check taint. And in this case, we could make a taint sync uh, that checks, for example, is the first argument of exec VE user controllable and has that taint? And if so, we detect the violation and we uh, error out the program and print a report. So you might be thinking compiler-based dynamic taint analysis in the kernel. I, I don't know if that exists. So basically, we have ported DFSAN to make KDFSAN for our project. Um, you can find it under our GitHub. So it's not fully fledged, but it worked for our use cases. So basically, how does our approach work? So we have some random system call handler with a system call argument X. And we, within, we want to detect this spectre gadget that we've seen earlier already. So we start by fuzzing the system call interface. And for that, we use a syscaller uh, to generate all kind of input that might be dangerous or that might create some interesting uh, gadgets. And next, we apply the attacker taint label to all the system call arguments um, to basically signal that the uh, user space has full control over those uh, arguments. And then we propagate the taint throughout the program. So that this could be like 10 functions deep in the call stack. It doesn't need to be straight here. Uh, and then we reach a conditional branch and we start something called uh, speculative emulation. Uh, so imagine that X would be larger than size here and you would, in theory, you would just skip over the block. But what we're doing now is we take a checkpoint uh, and then we basically execute uh, the flipped outcome of the branch as if that would be the normal case. So now we start executing the block uh, within that condition, even though X is larger than size. Uh, and we taint uh, X here again. And now we use something called memory error detectors to identify unsafe accesses. So basically what we use for this is uh, KSAN to detect out of bounds accesses. And we check if there's a KSAN uh, access with something that is tainted, which would mean that uh, you also have uh, control over how much you go out of bounds. Uh, because if you just go like always one byte out of bounds, it doesn't give you anything. Uh, you want a controllable out of bounds access. So that's what we use the taint analysis for. And then we apply the taint label, uh, the, sorry, the secret label to whatever is loaded by that access. Uh, and then when we get to the point where we have a secret dependent memory access, uh, this information gets encoded in the cache and our cache interference detector identifies such a gadget. And then finally, we basically revert all the speculative operations and restore back to the checkpoint. Uh, and then we can just continue until the next branch and re repeat the whole process. So that's the approach that we implemented in our tool, uh, Casper. And in the end, we obviously take the Linux kernel and then we take our runtime libraries uh, together with our LLVM passes, which do the dynamic taint analysis and the checkpointing and so on. And uh, we build the Casper, Casper instrumented kernel. And we fuzz that kernel with syscaller uh, to report uh, gadgets at runtime. And then we aggregate those in a statistics and build a website to basically present the results uh, to show you what is the taint that caused this, what is the syscaller uh, uh, reproducible uh, yeah, program. And then you can hopefully reproduce it and fix those. So with that, we've uh, discovered 1,379 uh, previously unknown gadgets. Um, but bear in mind that dynamic taint analysis is still fairly limited in how much control you have. 
so it doesn't tell you if, for example, of a 64 bit a byte a bit pointer, if you have full control over it at some point or not. So if you have some masking involved, it could mean that you only have control over certain bytes of the pointer and not all of it. So detect full controllability, you would need to use something more sophisticated as dynamic taint analysis. So now let's look at an, a case study that we found through our tool that we believe is almost impossible to find with a static analysis. Uh, and for that, I will do some background on uh, the, the list for each entry macro that probably most of you have used in the kernel. Um, but we will look at the internals of it, so I will recap that very briefly. So in the end, it's more or less just a for loop uh, where the initialization sets the position variable to the first entry of the loop, uh, of the list, sorry. Uh, and then in the terminating condition, we check if that element is currently uh, the head element. If so, we stop iterating. Uh, and otherwise we do incrementing and we set the post to the next entry. Uh, and in the end, if we look at it, and this gray area here is our struct, and we have the embedded list information down here, uh, and we have some member that we access within the loop called data here, and POS will always be pointing to the start of that struct. So let's look at some uh, example where we have a list with a head element and two elements, uh, and now we basically start iterating over that loop. So when we do list first entry, uh, we set pass to the start of the first entry, of course. Uh, and then we basically, within that loop, we access the data member and load that information out. So now we do uh, pass equals uh, the next entry. So we set pass to the start of the second element and we repeat the content of the branch uh, of, the, of the loop again and access data. So now what happens next is uh, POS will be set to the next entry again. So in this case, POS will be set to this out of bounds uh, memory area with the offset of the, the embedded list struct, uh, but there's no list, the entry around here. There's, the head element is not contained within the same struct as uh, the elements. So this will point to essentially bogus memory area. And now we reach the terminating condition uh, where we check if the list entry is the head and it is, so we stop executing. But what if we now mispredict that branch? Uh, we tell the CPU, uh, we think you need to do one more loop of the, one more iteration of the loop, even though it's not supposed to. Uh, so now within that loop, since we are the attacker, uh, the program will think that POS will point to a valid entry of the struct, but there could be any memory around that. Uh, so it will execute the content of that uh, loop again, and it will access the member data, which could be any secret if we're lucky. And then it will load out that secret uh, into some internal CPU structures. In this case, we call it the load buffer. Uh, and then an attacker could use a side channel to leak it. And this is basically possible on every uh, list for each entry iteration that you have in the kernel. And since you have them all over the place, it's quite easy to find some cases where this gets a problem. So finally, we uh, implemented a proof of concept exploit uh, for one instance of this gadget to show that it works. Uh, but this is just the beginning of the story. Uh, so essentially, this is an issue that cannot be solved with a simple array index no spec. You cannot do a bounce clipping uh, on this terminating condition. Uh, so you cannot apply the, the mitigations that have been used uh, by now. So how can we fix it? Uh, in this case, we have the macro again. Um, if, if, I mean, this list for each entry goes around the list and it also accesses the entries so that it's more convenient for the body of the loop. But the, well, you can also just have a list for each and then the body of the loop can also take the entry. So do you have the same problem in that case or not? 
uh, you would still have the same problem. Okay, thank you. Uh, because you can still mispredict the, 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 the outcome of the terminating condition, and then you would just do uh, get the position variable within the loop uh, straight afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the sense, your speculative window might be smaller because you need to do calculate the position element within the speculative execution rather than doing it before. Okay, thank you. Um, but I mean, there are so many iterators that I've just used this one as an example, because if we do all of them, they're almost the same and they all, most of them share the, the same issue. So how can we uh, fix this? Uh, in the end, what changed is the terminating condition. So we still uh, check the, the, same, the condition to terminate the, the loop is the same. Uh, but now we add uh, basically the second line here where we make sure uh, that when we reach that terminating condition, even in a speculatively safe manner, uh, we set the position variable to null. So we will still do a speculative iteration of the loop, but now POS will be set to null and you can hopefully not use it to, any, to leak any dangerous information. But this also means that the iterator variable will be invalidated at the end of the loop. So it will be set to null, and there are 450 plus locations that use the list iterator after the loop. And we found out uh, painfully by just making the, the fix and noticed that the kernel was panicking all the time. So luckily we were pointed out uh, to uh, Kotzinel script that basically finds all these uh, cases where the list iterator is used after the loop, so we could analyze them. Uh, and it turns out by looking at that list, there are actually some that are actual bugs that we found through going through that list. And now we're gonna look at some architectural bugs. So no speculation beyond this point, uh, consider this an offense operation. We, we just talk about architectural bugs from now on. So we start with uh, this code snippet. So we have again, list for each entry. And we have rec as the iterator variable. And then within the loop, we check if the member rec of that uh, has the address of, under, uh, of underscore rec. And if it does, we found the correct element and we break out of the loop. And after the loop, we basically check if that address is not what we were looking for, error out. Um, so that looks safe, right? We, we can just use that. That's, some people have the opinion this is safe, some people don't. I'm gonna show you it's not necessarily. Uh, so if we look at that, we see that the iterator variable will be used after the loop. And based on what I showed you before, you can already get the hunch that this is not great. So does it still look safe? In the end, it depends, but probably not. So we go back to a case study um, where we have a list again with two elements and the list head. Uh, and up here we have the same code that I've showed just now with the line highlighted that we're executing currently. So for the first iteration, rec will be pointing here uh, and we will access the member of rec here. And then we use that to compare it to underscore rec. Uh, and we didn't find the element that we're looking for, so we continue. So we do the same for the second element. And now if you remember, uh, rec will be pointing again out of bounds here. So if you use it after the loop, then rec rec will be uh, using something that is out of bounds again. Yeah. I think actually it's fine. It's just addition because of the ampersand. Uh, sorry, say again. I think that it's fine because it's just an addition. It's because of the ampersand. Oh, yes. So in the example that I showed here, it depends on the layout. But if you would imagine that, for example, the, the list uh, embedded struct would be uh, before uh, rec, then you could basically, if you're unlucky, then the information, the, the underscore rec could be located below that uh, head element. Uh, so for example, if you would imagine that uh, this, this member would be below this, the list head, uh, then for example, after the empty list head, there could be an element that uh, where underscore rec is. Uh, but we have seen cases where you don't have the ampersand, so it's even more clear. But in this case, 
If you assume that underscore rec could be an arbitrary pointer, it's already dangerous. But if you assume it's pointing to an, uh, an actual element, uh, it depends on the stack layout or, or on the struct layout, sorry. But we have shown that depending on how the struct layout is, uh, if for example, the, the member that you're accessing after the loop uh, of, of the loop here would be located after uh, the list embedded struct, you can still uh, make it work. So if you're unlucky and underscore reg will be whatever this is pointing to, uh, you could make a trick into not taking this branch even though you didn't actually find that element within your list. Like in a uh, um, portal. Um, would it have been maybe easier if you just, um, instead of head being not uh, uh, an element of, uh, you know, whatever is in the queue, to make it an element of whatever is in the queue. Like have it just be a zeroed out structure allocated. Um, yes, but I don't think the kernel will be able to change that anymore. Uh, because usually what happens, so here we have an empty list head. So uh, you could imagine this being, for example, a global variable. So you could just pad the struct around it to make it safe. Uh, you would waste some memory, of course, but that should be fine. But what you have most of the time is that this list head will be embedded in another struct. Uh, so for example, if you have a certain struct and it will contain uh, the list head pointing to a list of something else, uh, which you have most of the time, you would enlarge all of those structs that contain that struct uh, by that many bytes. Uh, and if you have that basically in both ways, uh, you cannot do that because then the one would be enlarged to fit the other one, but in the area that you enlarge, you would have a pointer again to the one you're pointing to, and then you would have to enlarge that one again. Uh, so we are calling this type confusion in C uh, because internally in the list iterator, it's using container off uh, to perform on the list head uh, which is not actually contained in the struct. Uh, so we call this a type confusion because this resembles basically an invalid downcast uh, in object-oriented programming. So you, for example, if you have a struct and you have a master type and uh, some subtypes, uh, you would use container off to go to one of the subtypes. Um, but if you don't do that incorrectly, uh, if you do that incorrectly, it's a type confusion. So we uh, raised these issues on the mailing list and basically we got the response from Linus uh, that the rule should be you never use the iterator outside of the loop. And the whole reason this bug can happen is that we didn't have C99 declare variables in loops. We should finally start using variable declarations in for loops. Um, so first I'm gonna show you what the correct way is to do the code that we have just seen. So now we have a separate variable that is basically just used for iterating. And we have one that points to the, argument, to the element that we want to find and we set it to no. And then we iterate over the loop uh, and only if we find the correct element, uh, we set rec to that element. And then after the loop, we can trivially check if rec was set or if it's still null. If it's set, we found the element. If it's null, we didn't. So in the end, this ended up with moving the kernel to a more modern version of C. So you can finally declare variables within the for loop itself. Um, now a bit about my experience and submitting some of these patches. Um, it's been a lot of fun, but it's also very time intensive, especially if you're doing a PhD uh, full time. And uh, I got around like 80 of the patches merged so far, which still leaves around 300 locations that are a problem. And unfortunately, patching has to be done one by one because they don't follow a certain pattern. They're all quite unique in their own way. Uh, but also it means without fixing all of them, 
uh, you don't have a real benefit of C11 or C99 because as long as you don't fix them, you cannot move the iterator variable into the loop. So for me, these three wide change sets were a very tricky start to submitting patches to the Linux kernel in general, because the same bug will need very different fixes depending on the maintainer and the subsystem, as most of you probably know. Uh, in general, it was also very difficult to know how to split those uh, into the pieces that you can submit. Uh, and different subsystems have different rules about it. How far do you split it or do you keep it in one patch set uh, and so forth. So very big sh uh, shout out to Mike Rappaport who's been a massive help in uh, answering all my stupid questions and helping me to get this into a stage that was actually uh, submittable to the mailing list. So we were thinking there might be even more type confusions in the kernel. So maybe it's time to build a new scanner for, for this kind of issue. Uh, so we were thinking, in, in general, any use of container off could potentially lead in a type confusion. Uh, you basically just give it a pointer and you tell it what type you're casting it to uh, without actually ensuring that whatever you're feeding it uh, is actually uh, the correct one. All you do is basically an, an offset operation to subtract some bytes. And if you do that uh, incorrectly, uh, you will have some bugs. So detecting those are ongoing work. So if you have any ideas or uh, uh, pointers on what to look at, I'm happy to take them as questions or after the talk. So as a conclusion, uh, we started building a speculative gadget scanner, ended up with some real type confusion bugs, uh, which caused the kernel to move to a more modern version of C. And now we're looking into more type confusion issues that we found in the kernel. So we have some examples uh, already, but we're still looking to enhance our script and find more. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Us. So I have an online question I can start out with. Uh, this is from Dmitry Vyukov. Uh, he asks, can you share a bit about how you do speculative execution and restore the snapshot? Yeah, so I left that out because it was just too much for this presentation, but we basically do all of that uh, compiler based. Uh, so basically when I say we take a snapshot, it means we uh, take a copy of the stack, uh, stack frame of that function and all the registers, but obviously that is not enough. Uh, so basically when we start the speculative emulation, uh, what we do is uh, every time there's a memory write operation, uh, we store what was uh, in that location before in an undo log and then when we reach the end of that, check, uh, of that speculative emulation, we roll back and play back all the memory that was modified within uh, basically that uh, window so that the memory will be in the same spot as it was originally. And then we restore the registers and the stack frame. Uh, and then you should be good to go and have everything in the stage that you were before. Uh, of course, there are some limitations. Uh, so for example, if you write something to a driver or you write something uh, out to the network, it won't work. Uh, so also inline assembly is uh, fairly limited because we cannot instrument that with LLVM. So we have certain spots where we cannot do speculative emulation. In. But we showed that it works in almost the most of the kernel. Okay, thank you. So Dimitri, thanks you as well. Are there more questions? Oh yes, so two questions. One is uh, when we do the simulate, when we do the emulation, how can we do if there are several nested branches in a row? And then, and then the second one is how many instructions should we take a look when we do the emulation in the first branch prediction? Uh, so the first question was about nested uh, branches, right? Right. Uh, so basically for this one now we, only flip one branch and then we execute basically until we think it's the end of that window and then we roll back and then we go to the next branch. But obviously CPUs are smart enough to do nested speculation. So if you would want to do it properly, uh, if you reach the second branch within your speculative emulation, you would have to take a second snapshot, fork off again and mispredict that branch again, roll back to that stage and continue from there. Uh, but we showed that you can find enough gadgets with just mispredicting one branch. And the second question, I'm not sure if I uh, heard it correctly, but it was about uh, 
uh, which structs to look at or um, how many instructions should we take a look I mean for the speculative or yes yes so basically it in the end the issue could be in any uh, list for each entry um, so basically any struct that you're iterating over could be an issue with list for each entry uh, but then it depends also uh, we found one case where, for example, the head element was contained in an, another struct, and then the member that you're accessing within the speculative uh, iteration of the loop is something that you have full control over. Uh, so you do a memory load with the, something that you can just set with procfs, uh, and then you control the full pointer. You can load something arbitrary in, and you can leak that uh, through a side channel. For a lot more information, it's probably best to look at the paper or just talk to me afterwards. Um, but it always depends how much control you have around that uh, head element or if there's anything secret to leak. More questions? Yeah, over here. Uh, hi there, my name is Nick. I work uh, on keeping the kernel building with Clang so people can do more interesting research like this. So yeah. very exciting to see this. Uh, as soon as I saw DF SAN, I thought, ooh, I'm sure we can find some interesting bugs with it. So very exciting to see this line of research. Um, in particular, um, one of the issues that we've dealt with significantly a lot in the past is information disclosures to user space, where some structure is filled in with, with kernel memory and generally patterning gets to user space. Um, in your experience working with DFSAN, do you think DFSAN might be an appropriate tool for us to use to try to um, automate finding more instances of these information disclosures? Yeah, I think so. I think there are a lot of uh, applications that you could use the kernel DSN for. And I think this is definitely one that uh, might even be suited better because you just taint some memory and if that one flows to user space, you have a problem. Uh, for us, we were using it to determine controllability, which mm -hmm. can be tricky. But so, yeah, thanks for uh, making it possible to compile the kernel with LLVM. Uh, in the beginning of this project in 2019, there was no LTO support, so we were doing it with a GLLVM, which uh, was like massive gigabytes of LLVM bitcode, and it was horrible. So when we moved to LTO uh, and you were using our passes on that, it was making our life a lot easier. Oh, have it here is useful for more than one, more more than one thing. Yeah, <laughs> really cool. Thanks. Thanks. More questions. Okay, so thank you.